RCC, as we take our communion and we think about how God has been so good to us, I just want to say right now how just thankful I am to be a pastor here at RCC. This place is amazing. And I love the people here, and you make it just a huge honor to be a pastor. Let me give you an example of that here at RCC. There's a First Coast Women's Service, as you remember, we raised uh, these baby bottles, raised money uh, for these baby bottles. And bottom line is, you know, if you had a penny, put it in there, and every penny goes to save a baby's life or saves, or goes to save souls through moms and dads who come. And and as we reflect on the salvation that comes through Jesus, that works a lot of different ways. One of the First Coast Women's Services is saving lives of these babies. And I just want to tell you what happened in our baby bottle drive and kind of give you an a update. We've been doing baby bottle drive uh, through First Coast Women's Services from 2016 to 2020. We started in 2016. During that time, RCC has raised at least $8,200 together to gather in our baby bottle drive. And that's just tremendous. Praise God for that. So the whole time, that's what we raised, and, and so I want to encourage you with this. Um, I, I got a call from First Coast Women's Services this past week, and they wouldn't leave me alone. They just kept calling me, kept calling me, finally had time to call, and said, so we want to talk to you. And I'm like, what did we do? Am I in trouble? Like, what did RCC do now? I mean, and, and they said, no, 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 this is really good. I want to talk to you about the baby bottle drive. Guess what RCC did? And I said, well, what, what, how, how, what did we do? She said, just in 2021 alone, RCC raised Ten thousand two hundred dollars, right there. Ain't that amazing? Two thousand, ten thousand two hundred dollars. And um, and what makes this amazing is that they've been doing this since two thousand and three. All right, and all that time for almost twenty years now. Whether it be St. John's County, Duval County, Clay County, doesn't matter what community it is, nobody has raised that much money. No church has raised that much money through the baby bottle drive. Can we give God the glory for that right there? He deserves it. And so I tell you what, it is an honor, like I said, to be a pastor on staff here at RCC. You have no idea how much encouragement we get from you as you live out the life of Jesus Christ. And I, before we forget, I want to welcome everyone right now who's joining us online right now. Wherever they are, we love you guys. Can you guys welcome those who are joining us online this morning? We love you so much. I'm so thankful for brothers and sisters right now. And I want to encourage you with this. And as we go into our It Is Written, if you don't have one of these Bibles, I want to encourage you to buy one today, pick up one today, and, and keep going with us. If you don't have money, that's okay. Just grab a Bible at the Welcome Center, and, uh, and we would love to hand you one of those Bibles and just join us in this journey as we continue on. Because that's why we do what we do, because of what God tells us. He tells us to love Him and love people, all right? And we get that from God's Word. And so that's what directs us as a church. I want to ask you this question as we start today, and here it is. What would it take for you to turn your back on God? What would it take for you to spin on your heels and turn your back and walk away from God? What would it take? Because that's kind of what we're looking at today. I've had people who come up in my life and they've been mistreated by the church, mistreated by a Christian spouse, mistreated by, you know, Christians in their family, a Christian attorney, and they just basically said, you know what, to God... I'll call you, you don't call me. In fact, it's not too reverent occurrence for a pastor to have someone come up to you and just say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just leaving, I'm, I'm leaving. You're like, leaving, leaving, you're moving away, you're transitioning, what's going on? No, 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 I'm leaving God. And they walk away, and, and a lot of times, if you ask them what it is, they were betrayed by a church, betrayed by their Christian family, betra betrayed by a Christian spouse, whatever, whatever happened. They just go, you know what, I, I'm done. And they just, they just kind of hit a breaking point, and they say, I can't do this anymore. And they walk away. And it's tough when you see them walk away because you know that things are not going to go well for them. And you're like, that's not good. And it breaks your heart. So the question I have for you this morning is this. What would it take, how bad would circumstances have to be in your life for you to turn your back on God? And so in our daily Bible reading, we dive into a guy named Ezekiel. And, and, and if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Ezekiel, be in chapter 1. And we'll start there in just, just a moment. But 
As we look into what's going on right now in our world, many of us are kind of amped up. We see what's going on in Afghanistan, and I can't, I can't help but think about, you know, if, you know, what it must be like to be a hostage or held in, in a house or against my will as American trying to leave the country, and, and there's a lot of emotions, there's anger, there's resentment, there's revenge, there's vicious feelings of retaliation, right? And then I think, what if I was one of them? What if I was a group of people in a house and we're trying to get to the airport? What would, I, what would I say as a pastor of Jesus Christ? What would I say to my fellow Americans or whoever it may be? How would I handle that situation? And believe it or not, the Bible actually talks about hostages. It actually has a situation where people are hostages held against their will in a place where they don't want to be, hundreds of miles from home against their wish. Because of the Jewish rebellion, God has brought the Babylonians to send out the, the Jews in exile back to Babylon. And I'd like you to blow off the dust from this book called Ezekiel, all right? And we're going to look at it here as one commentator said about Ezekiel, Robert Willis. He said, Ezekiel, he called it this way. He said the commentary was all things weird and wonderful, all right? So if you've read Ezekiel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's kind of weird. But before we look at it, let me kind of give you some backstory, get better acquainted with this man named Ezekiel. And I'll try not to make this dry, all right? I'll try not to make this dry. The Bible is very, very interesting. It takes a preacher like me to make it dry, okay? And so here we are in Ezekiel chapter 1. It says this, in my 30th year, he says, in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kabar River, if you ever traveled to South Florida or Southern California, you'll see canals all over the place. And these canals send water from one source, like in this case, the Euphrates River, send it to the innards of the land to make it fertile where they can raise crops. This actually could borrow rivers and canal that goes 60 miles. It's pretty impressive. But Ezekiel is not, de- he's not impressed at all. In fact, he's discouraged. And he's, he's among discouraged people while he is by this canal, the Kabar, the Kabar River. In Psalms 137, it talks about how the exiles were asked by their, it says captors or it says tormentors. To sing songs of Zion. Sings about the songs of your homeland. And what's ironic about that command from the tormentors and the Babylonians to the Jews is that hostages don't normally sing, right? Hostages don't normally sing, especially when their focus is not on God. It's hard to sing. And so that's kind of the spiritual scene of Ezekiel chapter 1. It says, while, it says, in the 30th year, in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kabar River, first note I want you to make here is this, and it's in your your notes. This Ezekiel is a 30-year-old hostage. He's a 30-year-old hostage. Scholars believe that when he says 30th year, he's, he's talking about his age. He's not talking about a king's reign. And so in, the, in, in early years, he watched the demise of Judah, and he watched another nation come in. He is a broken man. He's already been there for about five years, and he's a few years older than Daniel. Daniel, we're going to talk about later, is a contemporary of Ezekiel. Daniel is serving right now in the government system. He's, he's got a prominent role in the government, while Ezekiel, as, an, as a Jew, a fellow Jew, is among the people. And he's teaching as a prophet in the land among the people. And I think it's pretty amazing how God can put this man or this woman and this person over here, put Joe over here and Sarah over here and, and, and Nathan over here and Bob over here and Rebecca over here to accomplish certain amazing things at certain times for his purpose. And so Daniel and Ezekiel are contemporaries. They have different gifts and, they're, and they have different uh, capacities The second thing you know about Ezekiel is this. Ezekiel is a married man. He's a married man. And you have to understand that context when you read what we're about to read right now in chapter 24. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to chapter 24. We're going to go there. And this is expand from chapter 1 to chapter 24, four, four years. So four years later, in Ezekiel chapter 24... We see this tragic piece of information. It starts in verse 16. It actually says before that, the word of the Lord came to me. And then Ezekiel says, here's what the word of the Lord is in verse 16. Son of man, with one blow, I'm about to take away from you the what, church? The delight of your eyes. What? With one blow, I'm about to take away the, the delight of your eyes. Do not yet, do not lament, do not weep, do not shed any tears. What? 
groan. He says, quietly, do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban, turban fasted, your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your mustache and beard and, or eat the customary food of mourners. In other words, I don't want you grieving when you lose the delight of your eyes. And then it says this in verse 18, so I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening, he says, what happened? My wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. Note that God told Ezekiel ahead of time that he was going to take the delight of his eyes away. In fact, if your spouse is with you, all right, if you, if you have your spouse right now in the room, I want you to look at them right now and say, uh, you're the delight of my eyes. Go ahead right now and turn it to your spouse. You're the delight of my eyes. Go ahead. Husbands, lead the way here. My wife, you're the delight of my eyes, Rachel, all right? So I hope you said that back. I'm not sure if you did or not. But anyway, <laughs> couldn't hear it. But but, you know, it, you're delight- so that's, that's what happened. You, he loses his wife. His wife dies suddenly. And then, and then all of a sudden, he is not to cover his face. He is not to mourn at all. I mean, it happens like that and seems kind of cruel unless you realize that God is illustrating a, a truth, a hard truth through Ezekiel. The people were to see in Ezekiel. Here's, here's something in your bulletin. They were seeing Ezekiel. He was a mirror the, their life. The lives of Israel. They'll see in Ezekiel their lives. They, they were the ones, hear me, that killed their relationship with God, and yet they did not mourn. They're the ones who killed their relationship with God, and yet they didn't grieve. They were the ones who killed their relationship with God, and they did not care. Ezekiel was a model before them, their very own lives, their very own lives, and what they did to God, the shock of it all, Wax them out, all right? Look what they do. It says this. Then the people asked Ezekiel, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Why are you acting like this? Some of you have teenagers. You're you're asking the same question. You're like, why are you acting like this? Like, they couldn't get over why, why he's behaving this way. And so I said to them, Ezekiel says, the word of the Lord came to me. Say to the people of Israel, remember, this is on the hills of his wife dying, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes. With this model through Ezekiel's life, he's showing this. The object of your affection, the sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword, and you will do as I have done. You will not cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary foods of mourners. You will keep your turbans on your heads and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn. You will not weep, but you will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourselves. Ezekiel, he says, this is God saying, Ezekiel will be a sign to you. You will do just as he has done. And when this happens, you will know, you will know, you will hopefully finally know that I am the sovereign Lord. And I don't know how you read those verses, but let me tell you how I read those verses. When God has his spokesperson at times, what he does with a spokesperson, he has them model the message. He has you live it out. It adds authenticity when you have to model the message. And you can talk all day long about the sufficiency of God, right? You can sing songs all day long about the sufficiency of God. But when the bottom of your life drops out like it has for several of you recently, when the bottom of your life drops out and you, you model that sufficiency, that gets people's attention. I mean, you can sing songs all day long, but when you model it, as people watch you live your life, man, it's a wake-up call for people around you. Your neighbors cannot ignore it when you respond to tragedy that way. Your family cannot ignore it when they see you remain stable going through a storm as God calls upon you to model that message. He says, hey, I want you to wear it. It's like putting clothes on. All right? God says through Ezekiel, they will see my message that it's true, that it's authentic. And I can tell you that when you work, when you communicate certain truths about God, often says, God will say to you, all right, I hear what you're saying, I hear what you're singing, but all right, it's time for you to model it. It's time for you to put it on. Let me show that it actually does work. We talk about God being sufficient. He's my all in all. We talk, we talk about that. No matter what goes on in my life, I'm not going re- to reject God. But then pain shows up. And guess what? You have to model that truth. 
You have to model what you say. It brings authenticity in the eyes of people around you. It's a difficult work, and it's not just for pastors. It's for every one of us. I had a mom call me this past week, and she told me about the tragedy of what she was going through with her health and other things and, and her job and a whole bunch of situations. I just told her, I said, you know what? You're modeling right now. Your faith is modeling right now that it's real for people around you. And she said, you know, that's interesting because I just had one of my kids come up to me and tell me that they were just inspired by how faithful I was as I was walking through this. I want you to know right now people are watching you. More than you realize, the ripple effect of your life is much bigger than you realize. People are watching you. They're watching your faith. And so the message that God has given you, he has told you to put it on. He's told us to wear it, not to announce it, just to wear it. Remember, Ezekiel was not to preach. He was actually to be silent, all right? And God says, through this living object, they will not be able to to deny, he says, that I'm alive and this is a huge, huge lesson. Truth gains authenticity when it's modeled, not just when it's declared. It's important to declare it, but it's even bigger when you model it because it brings about the authenticity. It seems unfair. It seems like a cruel assignment. How in the world does he get this kind of strength? And, and to kind of get a, an image of this, And get our mind wrapped around this. I want to take us back a few weeks in our daily Bible reading to a guy named Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Everybody say Habakkuk on the count of three. One, two, three. Habakkuk, all right? Habakkuk is an interesting guy. He's a prophet before Ezekiel when the prophet business was really tough. It's always tough. He would teach the people to open up their hearts to God and the people wouldn't listen. And all he knew for many, many years of trying to get these people to turn their back to God, all he knew was disappointment, discouragement, resistance. And then God says to Habakkuk one day, I'm raising up the Babylonians. And when he says that, Habakkuk knows exactly what's going to happen. Because the people won't soften their hearts, they won't repent, they won't follow God, they won't humble themselves, the Babylonians are going to come over the hills and destroy Israel, God is saying to Habakkuk, it's time for the heavy hand of discipline to come on my people because nothing, nothing else has worked. And so Habakkuk is a leader. That's what the first thing you know, Habakkuk is a leader. Habakkuk, like many of you have the gift of leadership, you can see things happening before they actually happen. And Habakkuk has that ability, It's it's it's, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, right? He looks out in the future and he sees the Babylonians coming over the hills. He sees in his mind the, the, the ravaging that's going to happen. Huge numbers of people are going to be killed. Women are going to be abused. Children are going to be slaughtered. The temple will be destroyed. Houses, possessions, lands, businesses will be taken over by the enemy. I mean, really bad stuff is going to happen. It even gets worse. Starvation is going to happen. Starvation. People, you're going to watch, die because they can't eat. You're going to see medical care go away. People can't get treatment. You're going to see waterborne illnesses take effect and see just, just, just wreaking havoc among the people. Just unimaginable suffering is coming Habakkuk's way. And everyone's going to think they're experiencing a foretaste of hell. Now Habakkuk knows what's coming and he knows that he will not be spared of this experience that's coming his way. I mean, he has preached his heart out. He has prayed. He has hoped for these people to return to God. Yet he is going to be swept up in the discipline along with all the other people. I mean, he doesn't get a break. So what does Habakkuk do? After all this preaching, all this praying, all this hoping, and he learns this bad news, what does he do? He takes out his pen and he writes one of the most faithful, incredible declarations that you'll ever read in scripture some people argue this is it it's from Habakkuk chapter 3 and I want you to look at this with me Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 amazing courage he says this though the fig tree does not bud and and there's no grapes on the vines though the, the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food he sees what's coming he knows what's coming 
Though there's no sheep in the pen, there's no cattle in the stalls, read with me, church, yet I will what? I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will what? Be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord, what, church? The sovereign Lord is what? My strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. <laughs> what he's doing, he's looking at God. He's not looking at his circumstances. What, what he does as a leader, he keeps his mind focused on God. He knows all that's coming his way. And he's saying, God, there's no set of circumstances that can come in my life that would make me turn my back on you, God. No set of circumstances. I'm standing, I'm staying, I'm enduring. Better than that, I will rejoice in God, my Savior. And he says, when everything collapses around me, when the harvest is gone, the economy goes south, even though we'll be occupied by wicked forces, I'm not going to cave. I'm going to stay strong. I'm going to find my joy in you. That's the end of it. That's how I'm going to roll. That's how I'm going to stand. Well, the question has to be asked, how does a guy stand like that? <laughs> how in the world does he take that? How, the, how, how does he have that much courage? How does he have much, that much faith? Has he gone over like this psychotic edge? I'm like, is that what's going on here? And I think the answer is embedded right in the text when he says, you know what? My sovereign Lord, he gives me strength. The sovereign Lord is my strength. That's where I draw my strength. I will be joyful in God, my Savior, who will enable me to do what I couldn't do. He will give me strength when I don't have the strength. There's been times in my life, and this is what's so important about Christian community, there's been times in my life when I couldn't pray, and I'm so thankful for people in this church who could pray at times when I couldn't pray. Sometimes we need the strength of others through God around us. He's going to be the source of my strength. Now let's think about this for a second. Here's a statement I want you to chew on. The best things in life, guess what, are not things. The best things in life are not, are not things. Say that with me on count of three. One, two, three. The best things in life are not things. How many of you guys believe that? Raise your hand if you believe it. The best things in life are not things. And that's true. But I want you to think about this for a minute. Habakkuk sees the impending doom coming, economic situation coming, and he's saying this. If every external comfort is ripped away in my life, I will find the internal comfort that I have in God and being in relationship with God he is my Savior. That will be my strength. That's all I need. That will be enough. When all those external gifts are stripped away, I think being a redeemed relationship with God, I think that will be enough for me. These guys are incredible. How do they have that much faith in the face of tragedy is my question. Truth about me, not pretty, but true. My ability to worship and rejoice in God is painfully too dependent upon the circumstances in my life. Let me just be honest. Again, I'm not proud of it. It's just true. I, I don't know about you. But sometimes if a handful of circumstances in my life, don't, they go south, I go from being a worshiper to a whiner. All right? Is anybody else with me? All right? Do you do that? I mean, I, I go from being a worshiper to a whiner, like, you know, in 0. 0.6 seconds, right? I can, I can, I can quote, you know, Psalms, uh, uh, Psalms 8. Oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And I walk out the doors and something happens like, oh, Lord, no. You know, all of a sudden I just start crumbling sometimes. And in the few times that my health has gone bad, you would not be proud of your pastor. Very tempting to, to kind of have a self-pity instead of praise, Right? Instead of adoration to God enduring with his strength, which makes me ask the question, what in the world does Habakkuk, what does Ezekiel have that I don't have? And I've been asking that question over the last several weeks, and the answer's not pretty. And I don't, know how to, I don't know how to put this together. I'm trying to figure out how to communicate this, so this is the best shot I got. Here it is. Ezekiel and Habakkuk wanted God's favor more than they wanted God's gifts. They wanted God's favor more than they wanted God's comforts and God's blessing. Habakkuk knows that all the economic gifts are about to be taken away from the enemy. He says, you know what? I think I can make it without those gifts. Ezekiel is about to lose the delight of his eyes, and he does. And he says, you know what? 
The one thing I can't live without is the favor of God. I need his presence in my life. I cannot live without your love for me, God. I know I'm still favored. I know you're present among me. I know you love me. And I'm declaring to you today, this very day, but before the onslaught, even though the fig trees are not budding and there's no grapes on the vine and the crops are failing and there's no food, there's no sheep in, in the pen, no cattle in the stall, he says, yet... Yet I fully intend to keep rejoicing in you, God. Take the externals away. I have my eternal Savior. He's my strength. And if all I have is you and it all goes away, I declare today, he says, you will be enough. You will be enough. Now think about it for a moment. Can you say that? Can you say that? Can you say, I still have God? I still, have, I still have the Lord's strength, and, and, and when things become a living hell, I will relentlessly rejoice in God, my Savior. Like, do you realize that you're going to be all right? No matter what happens to you, you're going to be all right, and you decide, like the prophets, I will not turn my back on God. Can you say that? I think about my friend Scott. Scott is uh, my best friend in college. In fact, I named my youngest son River. His middle name is Scott after this guy right here. Scott and I uh, did a lot of things together. Scott was always kind of a, a, wild, a wild guy, but he, he continued to grow in the Lord. He got married. He grew more in the Lord, started having kids. When he started having kids, I realized he's beating me. So we started having kids. Like It's kind of a competition, you know. Now both of our oldest are now gone to college, and it's just amazing to think about how, how um, Scott has just ripple affected in my life in so many ways. And I saw him grow when he had children. I saw him grow even further when he was diagnosed with cancer. I saw him continue to fight and continue to grow his family during that, during that trial. And then at age 33, one of his last social media posts was when he posted the words from Paul who said these words while Paul was in prison. Scott took them on as his battle cry. He says, I will rejoice. I will say it again, rejoice. And Scott died at age 33. And I think to my life, and I think about Scott's life, and it hit me after he passed that he never complained, he never whined, he never played the victim card. He always fought, he was always faithful, and he was always thinking of other people all the way to the end. All he had was God at the end. And guess what, for Scott, that was enough. That was enough. And to the people of RCC, I want to ask you, what's at the core? What's at the core of your relationship with God? What's at the core of the core? <laughs> Are you mainly into God because you want his blessings and you want the magic wand when you pray? You want his provisions, you want his gifts, you want his comfort? Is that what you're really into with, his, with God? Or at the core of it all, would you be quite content if he really is all that you had? Could all the best things in life be taken away and could you find joy in this life with just him? As I was thinking about Ezekiel, I was thinking about Habakkuk, one thought that came to my mind, and that is they both held on to God. Even though everything was stripped away, both of these men knew that their little story was fitting into a bigger story. It was fitting into God's redeeming narrative of restoring this broken world. These men knew that they were called to work in their community so God could infuse in that community restoration. And that was part of God's bigger plan was to use them in this world. These men knew that, that God was right. And they said this, they said, it's, it's not about me. It's not about my story. It's not about my personal story. I'm a part of a larger story. And I'm going to say, they said this to God. They said, God, your ways are higher than my ways. I'm going to say, God, can you just work it out? So that my story, however you want to write it, can fit into your bigger, greater story. Because that is where I find meaning, they said. I find meaning when my little story, my little life, my little meager life fits into your greater, bigger story. And the happiest Christians I know are the ones who have settled once and for all, who is this all about? What is my life? Who is it really about Remember Paul, Paul cries out and he says these words in Acts 20. He says, it's not about me. 
It's not about my little meager circumstances, he says. But my life, look at this, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me. My life's worth nothing unless I finish the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. Okay, well, what's that work? That's kind of the question I have. What's the work? Well, the work of telling others the good news. That's the work. That's my purpose. About the what, church? About the wonderful grace of God. That's your purpose. That's why you have air right now in your lungs. That's why your brain is firing off. This is your purpose, to tell others about the wonderful grace of God. You're looking for your purpose? There it is. It's all about God. It's what Paul's saying. It's not about me. It's about his story, his purposes in this world, about my meager, meager life working its way into syncing up with God's greater, bigger story. That's what brings me purpose. And the question I have for you, RCC, is can you say that? Can you say that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer is an amazing man. He grew up in a very wealthy family, could have done anything he wanted with his life, and he decided to go to school to study theology. He went to study to be a pastor. He graduated and ended up pastoring a little church. Things are going well. He's content until the Third Reich shows up, until the Nazis show up. And they basically say to, to Dietrich, they said, you know what? We love all churches. Once you guys join us, we're exterminating the Jews, you know, whatever. But let's keep, let's keep this thing going. And he's like, I beg your pardon, what would you just say? Amazingly enough, a lot of churches went along with it. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer took a stand. He says, we can't support this fascist leader. We can't support Hitler. And so he took a stand. They prayed about it. And when they took their stand, the worst thing possible happened. They came in. The Nazis shut down their church. They arrested Dietrich. They put him in prison. And he was there for several years until one day they brought him out in the courtyard. They brought him out in the courtyard and they put a wire around his neck. And it was in that moment that he realized, this is my last day on earth. And they said, do you have any requests? Do you have any final requests? And he says, yes, I have one. Can I pray? They said, make it quick. He dropped down on his knees, and he started praying to God. And, and, and someone chronicled this, and he basically, to the gist of it was this. He just prayed to God, and he said, God, thank you so much for my life. Thank you so much for my ministry. Lord, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for my great family. Thank you for giving me courage to stand for those who could not stand for themselves. God, maybe in some ways you can work in my story. My story can be part of your story in, in stopping the extermination of the Jews. But no matter what, to you, God, I want to say thank you for my life. Thank you for how it has panned out. And he stood up and they hung him. His final act on this planet was worship. And you think, man, he had a tough assignment. <laughs> I mean, he paid a price. Ezekiel paid a price. Habakkuk paid a price. Paul paid a price. Dietrich paid a price. And while they paid a price, their courage came from a deeper center. It didn't come from a, it was not a begrudging courage. They have a joy. They have a knowledge that the arc of their little life joined in the greater, bigger arc. It was infused in the greater arc of God's narrative of how he was changing, redeeming, restoring this world. That's the most important thing in life. What's the most important thing in your life? Do you follow God because of the gifts? Or are you a Christ follower who would say this, God, there are no set of circumstances that could come in my life that would make me turn my back on you. In fact, I will stay faithful no matter what comes. I will rejoice. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Is that you? Can you say at the core of your core, can you say these words, my hope, my only hope, is built on one thing, and that is nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you say that, church? Is that what it's really about for you? You know, I'm so thankful for our online community that joins us, because, you know, a lot of stories are happening right now online, and one of those stories is I got to visit with a guy named Don Loop this past week. And Don 
watches us every week online, he and his wife Nancy. He's, he's not able to because of his health to come here and, and um, he's so thankful for what God is doing. He's so thankful to be part of RCC. Even though he can't be here in person, he is so thankful to be part of RCC. And uh, so giving and so wonderful, so encouraging. And amazing thing about Don is as, as he was struggling this past week, I talked to him, he just encouraged me. And even though his health is, is failing, he decided to encourage and bless me. I thought I came to encourage him. He was encouraging me. And Don went home with the Lord yesterday. And I think to myself, at the end of his life, all the way to the end of his life, he finished strong. His hope was in nothing else, nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And I hope I can end like that. I want to end my days encouraging a pastor, encouraging someone in the name of God, not playing the victim card, not going, what was me? Just right now, just going, you know what, God? No matter what comes my way, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be joyful. And it's because of your strength. It's not my strength. It's because of your strength. I want to end strong. And today, we're about to sing a song. I'm going to encourage you. As we sing this song, I hope you'll take the lyrics to heart. We sing this song a lot. A lot of us are growing up singing these lyrics. But right now, I want you to pay attention to the words that are coming out of your mouth. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. That's where my hope is built, nothing else except the blood of Christ. Will you stand right now? Will you stand? We're going to sing the song, but before we do that, we're going to make a faith declaration, all right? And I need you right now. I want, I want us to say this with confidence. I know many of us are going through trials. That's what Habakkuk's talking about. But at the end of the day, when we get to the highlighted part, I'll rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in, in, in God, my Savior. I want you to say it like you mean it, all right, church? You guys online, you join us too. I don't care if you're in New York right now or in Alabama. Join us. I want to hear you. Let's say, let's speak the faith declaration, this poem that Habakkuk wrote, and let's make it come from the core of our soul. Let's say this together. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there's no sheep in the pen, and there's no cattle in the stalls, yet what church? I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Can we give God the glory right now? Can we give him the praise? He deserves it. So whatever situation you're in, we would love to pray for you. Go to the crosses on your left, your right. Maybe today's the day you proclaim, you know what? The Lord is my strength. For the first time, let us know. You can give your life to Jesus Christ. Let us know by that card. If you're online, hit the request prayer button. We would love to do that. Whatever it is right now. You need prayer. You need to repent. You need to recommit. You need to be baptized. Whatever it is, once you make that move, tell us at the cross. We'll be honored to follow up with you. Right now, let's sing these lyrics. And let's give God the glory. Amen, church. Let's praise him now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking And I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. Sing again. My hope is built on nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. tell you what, I'm so excited. One thing I love about RCC is we're kind of loud and proud, all right? And one way we do that is our decals. In fact, many of you are here because of those decals, believe it or not. And I want you to notice something. When you put a decal on, I want you to notice what happened to this car right here, all right? Notice the part that did not get messed up, all right? <laughs> okay. So if you want your car protected, go ahead and just put them all over like a force field, okay? So we got them out there for you. Go ahead and grab one, slap it on your car, somebody else's car. Let's spread the word and bring more and more people here. Hey, I'll encourage you with this. That is our Human Life Protection Amendment. We're asking you guys to sign that. We want this on for 2022 on the ballot. So thus far, we have a, well, our goal is 1,000. Right now, we have 985 that have basically almost, we're almost there, church, almost there before this year, before this weekend. So go ahead, fill that out. Let's put it on the ballot. Don't forget about moms, moms out there. Also, zero dark early men hope to see you hope to see you zero dark early this Saturday at 5 30. I want you to know one more thing RCC God is with you God is being pronounced and saving lives for you can we give God the glory one more time before we leave together he is Lord of all he is with you go be a blessing go change the world we love you guys see you soon